The Salvation Army exploits free labor off the backs of the people within its drug rehabs, and as a result, they're even facing a class action lawsuit for unpaid wages because of it. You see, by calling an unpaid 40 hour a week job work therapy, they can force the people in their adult rehabilitation centers to work for free by leaving them with two options, either do the unpaid work or get kicked out of the rehab. But to understand how they're getting away with the scam of a lifetime, we have to look at how they lure people into work camps disguised as rehab programs to see behind the front they put up to avoid public scrutiny. Because the Salvation Army is evil, and by the end of this video, you'll know exactly why. Lost Ox Media. The adult rehabilitation centers run by the Salvation Army could only be what seemed like a gift from the heavens, offering a free long-term drug rehab for anyone seeking recovery whether or not they had insurance, which sounds like the most selfless act of public service that any organization could possibly offer society. You could essentially go through the program with nothing, literally nothing because everything would be provided for you. The Salvation Army would clothe you, feed you, put you through what they call treatment, and they would even bring in Medicaid reps that would help beneficiaries get insurance through the state. From the outside looking in, it seemed like this was the place to be if you were someone seeking recovery, looking to change things around. And let's face it, that sounds like a pretty righteous thing to do. What other facility would give you so much all without insurance or even an ID. I mean, clearly, the Salvation Army was doing God's work by healing those who are plagued by the disease of addiction. But oftentimes, things that seem too good to be true usually are. You see, the Salvation Army ARC's main focus is not rehabilitation. Their main focus is ensuring that each week, the beneficiaries in the program complete their mandatory work therapy, meaning every person going through the rehab is required to work 40 hours a week for the Salvation Army as part of their program. The idea being that each beneficiary's addiction has more than likely led them to being out of work for so long they're no longer acclimated to what it's like to have a job. So this work therapy serves as a means to help beneficiaries get used to working again, which looks great on paper and makes the Salvation Army sound like true heroes who are equipping people with the tools they will need to enter the real world once the seven month program is finished. But here's the thing, Every year, the Salvation Army takes in over 150,000 beneficiaries, each of them working at least 40 hours a week. Over the course of seven months, that would total out to 184,380,000 hours. Now, if every person that worked only made $10 an hour, that would amount to over $1.843 billion a year. And the Salvation Army doesn't pay any of that. Because remember, the beneficiaries that work and upkeep the facility do it all for no money. The only thing that they do get is a living stipend that begins at $5 a week and goes up only $1 every week until it caps out at 25 bucks. And if my math is correct, that doesn't equal out to 40 hours of work. The Salvation Army instead saves that money by mostly employing volunteers and doing the bare minimum needed to run their facilities. All that free labor is being squeezed out of substance abuse victims who are just seeking help with nowhere else to turn. And when the program is over, graduates are spit back out into the real world with very little resources, help, or money oftentimes leading them back to the lifestyles that got them into the Salvation Armies in the first place. And when some of these people inevitably fall from grace yet again, the Salvation Army gladly takes them back with open arms to rinse and repeat the process. It's like a revolving door where people come in off the street or from drug court, getting very little to no actual drug treatment, working 40 hours a week whilst not getting paid, and the Salvation Army will let you do this over and over and over again. 
it costs them very little compared to what they make off the labor and the beneficiaries get virtually nothing out of it. Sounds like a great deal for the Salvation Army and a shit deal for the people in the rehab program. But not all of these people going through these programs are actively seeking recovery. A good portion of them are either on suspended prison sentences or drug court, facing jail time if they don't complete the program. Giving the Salvation Army an endless supply of free workers provided by the court system. But surely they're not just doing this in the hopes that people will continuously come back to the program so that they can get even more free labor, right? But in essence, that's exactly what they're doing. And I speak from experience. I was once a lush that went through this same program, all seven months of it, and it wasn't fun. I fell for this facade. I did the free work and I graduated quickly realizing that if I didn't make moves for myself, I would just end up back there and I wasn't about to put myself through addiction or that program ever again. Initially, I thought I was going to a place that cared about my recovery first and foremost and having no insurance, money, or resources, the Salvation Army seemed like the perfect solution. But I wasn't prepared for how badly things would be run once I actually got in there. When you first walk into a Salvation Army ARC as a beneficiary, you're required to blow into a breathalyzer. This is normal. The breathalyzer sits at the desk of the doorman. This is also normal. But what's not normal is that the desk man is a beneficiary just like you. Why that job would be left to anyone but an actual employee is beyond me, because a beneficiary would be more likely to let people skip the breathalyzer, bring in illegal substances, or just come in past curfew, but that's just my opinion. After that, you're met with the houseman, who's an employee of the administration who helps run the building after their work hours. He'll show you around before bringing you to where you'll be staying. My first impression when walking in was I don't necessarily want to be here, but for what this place is, I'm sure it could be worse. But what I didn't know was that things were worse. I just had a very surface level impression on where I was, but it didn't take long to notice. The place was poorly kept and almost resembled a jail in and of itself. The showers were not very clean and had very little hot water with the rest of the bathroom areas oftentimes being dirty and having broken toilets and sinks. There wasn't AC in any of the sleeping quarters, forcing beneficiaries to use loud commercial fans that kicked up ever-increasing dust. The gym areas rarely got cleaned, and if you wanted something as simple as water throughout the day, you couldn't even get it from a water fountain because none of them worked. You had to get water from a water cooler that was refilled from the dish sink of the kitchen area when it was empty. And while that water may not necessarily kill you, it's still really gross to get your water from a sink area where everyone's dirty dishes were getting cleaned. And this was just the facility that I had went through. But after doing some research and speaking to a bunch of people who had gone through other ARCs, I was told that this was the norm at almost any facility that anyone had gone to. But the most disturbing thing that each one had in common was that they were all infested with bedbugs. Something I would learn firsthand within 24 hours of being there. My first night I grabbed a book from the common area to read in bed and as soon as I laid down and opened the book, I was greeted with a bedbug in the book. And bringing that up to the houseman or the administration would prove to be no help. At first, it seemed like they just didn't care. Every time the bed bugs were brought up to the administration, they would respond by saying, we're looking into taking care of it as best we can. Or they would oftentimes give us a spray that smelled like a mixture of rubbing alcohol and various chemicals. We never actually knew what it was that we were spraying on or around our bed areas. Not only that, it didn't even work. And here's the thing, the bed bugs were never going away. And as far as any Salvation Army ARC facility goes, they'll probably always be there. Because the reason the bed bugs are so prevalent in the Salvation Army ARCs becomes all the more unsettling when considering the root cause. 
the donation bins. Bed bugs oftentimes are spread through people's clothes. That's why when treating them, one of the first things you should do is isolate so you don't spread them even further. And this is what's so interesting about how they continuously make it into the ARCs. You see, a huge amount of the Salvation Army donations that go into these bins are clothes, bedding, and shoes. I'm sure you've seen these bins in small towns or near shopping complexes from time to time. The donations that people drop into those bins get picked up by the Salvation Army employees to be brought back to the warehouses at the rehabs. Not only that, the Salvation Army sends out trucks every day to pick up clothes, shoes, furniture, and other items that people donate from their homes for free, oftentimes done by an employed driver and an unpaid beneficiary. The Salvation Army has no sanitation process in place for anything that comes back to the warehouse. So beneficiaries have to work eight hours a day sorting through bags of donated clothes and such that could have came from God knows where. And all those clothes and items go straight to the thrift stores without being washed or cleaned in any way. And let's not forget, when you first arrive to the facility, they give you clothes. And that's not because you don't have any, you have to wear the clothes they provide you from the thrift stores. So just to recap, clothes come in, don't get washed or sanitized, they get sorted by rehab beneficiaries, they then get sent to the thrift stores still not being washed, and then they get sold to the general public. That's disgusting on its own, but it's actually worse than you think. Because it's not only clothes that are coming from those bins. I've opened up bags of straight trash, bags filled with diapers and other excrement, and bags of clothes that smelled like somebody had died in them. And despite all of this, clothes were almost never turned down for the thrift stores. That's why I personally don't shop at thrift stores, especially not the Salvation Armies. I'm sure they could afford some sort of sanitation process or at least run the clothes through washing machines. But instead, the money gets pumped elsewhere into the organization which might sound great to some as it could probably be going to other charitable things that they're doing, but what about the people going through the programs now? I'm sure saving at least $1.8 billion a year in labor costs, topped with what I could only imagine is tens of millions of dollars a year in profit from donated clothes, you would think that these expenses could be taken into consideration. Astonishingly, the Salvation Army fails to reinvest significantly into the programs or the facilities, and the limited provision of actual rehabilitation services within the ARCs further illuminates the organization's distorted priorities. With programs oftentimes only having a handful of counselors who oftentimes lack substantial substance abuse training, with reliance on outside volunteers for meetings, it's clear their focus has shifted away from recovery and more toward fulfilling the minimum requirements to sustain the program. Their emphasis on religious activities rather than evidence-based treatment further undermines the supposed mission of rehabilitation. And as a result, many beneficiaries find themselves merely going through the motions, left to navigate their recovery journey without adequate support or guidance and their stay in the program is completely reliant on their ability to work because the entire place is essentially staffed by the people who are going through the program. So the facilities are run on skeleton crews as far as actual paid employees go. The doorman, the stewards and janitors, the cooks, the warehouse workers, the movers that help drivers, the facility laundry, and the landscaping are all jobs done by the beneficiaries in the rehab. If they didn't work, the programs couldn't function. So it's pretty crucial that they try to keep these beds full. But there are so many homeless people, victims of addiction, and cases coming in from court that they can actually fill up pretty fast, meaning the administration gets more strict about kicking people out for minuscule reasons, such as speaking against the program or even being late to work. I've even seen people who were injured on the job 
get kicked out because they couldn't work anymore. The work takes priority over the recovery of the people in the program and the donation bins fuel all of that. As a matter of fact, during the beginnings of the pandemic, when the nation knew almost nothing about COVID, the Salvation Army only shut down its warehouses for a total of one week after the initial lockdown. The world still not knowing exactly what the virus was capable of, and the Salvation Army was still taking in donations from bins and sorting clothes that many people were probably trying to get rid of due to their fear of COVID contamination. When I witnessed that during my time in one of the ARCs, I knew right then and there that the Salvation Army didn't care about the well-being of anyone in its facilities. At the very least, they definitely didn't care about the facility that I was in. The organization fronts itself as a church, first and foremost, but make no mistake, it has all the signs of a corporation, and it's practically run like one. That's more than likely why every Salvation Army ARC also has a church on site, so that each facility can funnel all of its profits through that church status and avoid paying taxes, which is a typical corporate accounting move. As a matter of fact, even the church services themselves feel like a business transaction where some of these facilities have forced beneficiaries to pay tidings out of their own living stipends. Stipends that they could have used for toiletries, prescriptions, cigarettes, or whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, some of these facilities were forcing money out of people who really had none to give. And they forced themselves onto people like this all the time. There have even been reports of the Salvation Army showing up to natural disaster events without even being called upon, and they constantly self-deploy in this way anywhere disaster relief is needed. One might think this is their way of righteously stepping up to provide extra aid in disastrous times, but the truth is, when they show up to these events unprompted, they would then send bills to disaster relief funds afterwards and I'm talking huge itemized bills. Oftentimes, the Salvation Army would bill employee hours for everyone on site, despite most of their disaster relief being volunteers, forcing agencies like FEMA to pay huge bills whether they asked for the help or not. And scandalous company behavior like this is nothing new for the Salvation Army. Let's not forget about the countless allegations against them for discriminating on the LGBT community the numerous sex scandals, and even a $2 million toy scandal where a director of one of the warehouses was stealing toys that were to be donated. Hey, yo, and now, even with this class action lawsuit being filed against them, with them being sued in multiple regions across the United States, the Salvation Army still refuses to pay back any of those wages to anyone in the programs. So at the end of the day is their mission to help the people or to help themselves. We would know if they were more open about their practices, but this is a company that despises transparency. So much so that in 2004, they threatened to completely abandon their mission in New York City because the city asked that job descriptions state the company's mission clearly and asked employees to describe their church affiliations. New York's homeless population rises year after year and the Salvation Army was really going to leave a city in need of its help, all because they asked for a little transparency? They don't really want you to know what they're all about, or what happens behind the doors of their facilities. That's probably why beneficiaries are forbidden to have cell phones in Salvation Army homeless shelters, warehouses, and ARCs. It's because if they were allowed to record the things that they had to live with while in those facilities, social media would have a field day with it and the Salvation Army would be forced to clean up its act. Yes, they do charitable things with some of the money that they're donated, but they're also billing disaster relief out the ass, exploiting free labor at a human trafficking level, and dodging taxes like Neo from the Matrix 
all while volunteers are ringing bells outside of Walmarts during Christmas so that bigwigs at the Salvation Army headquarters can live off of hefty salaries with virtually no living expenses. Hell, you wouldn't even have to be a corporate officer for the Salvation Army to pay for all your living costs. Lieutenants, captains, and upward all get their cars, gas, houses, utilities, food, clothes, cell phone bills, and salaries all paid for by the organization, which gets paid by your donations, whether it's in the form of cash or clothes and goods that they then sell in their stores. But this doesn't mean that everyone who works for the Salvation Army is completely happy with being in the Salvation Army, because having all of these things paid for essentially puts you at the mercy of the organization. They'll always have to do whatever the organization asks. They'll essentially always be on the clock. All of their interactions, work colleagues, friends, and in some cases, even their own families all become part of or with other Salvation Army officers or employees, leaving them in an echo chamber where they ultimately fall completely in suit with the organization's wicked ways, believing they're doing only good and perpetuating the company's ideologies deeper and deeper into their minds, proving that the Salvation Army isn't just bad for the people not in it, the Salvation Army is bad for society as a whole. I just want to thank those who have made it this far. It's pretty clear you're not a big fan of the Salvation Army either. Drop a like if you too refuse to donate to them. And if you want to support the channel, hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications so that you never miss an upload. It's completely free and it helps the videos reach as many people as possible. This has been a Lost Ox Media production. Until next time, thanks for watching.